Father, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you for who you are in our lives. For you are King of kings, you are Lord of lords. And we ask that you would now enter in, take control of our minds and our hearts, fix our focus upon you, pour out an anointing that makes preaching easy, listening receptive and application practical. Touch every hearer today. Remove any distraction that would be a stumbling block from us receiving the full measure of what you have in store for us today. And alas, oh God, our prayer is that if there's someone who does not know you in the error of their ways and in the pardon of their sin, I pray, Lord, that you would move upon their hearts, that you would draw them close to you so that they would choose you as Lord and Savior, and that they would leave this place never to be the same again. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All the people who love the Lord, put your hands together. Help me give God praise in here. Today we conclude the official sermon series, The Ultimate Pool Party. And I would like to call our attention today again to the book of Acts. Chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. I've been meaning to say something over the last couple of Sundays, but it is so good to see Dr. and Mrs. Bowers back in worship with us. They were out for some time with extended illness, but God is a healer and a restorer. And so good to have them with us today. Acts chapter 16, I want to begin around verse 25. And if you'll allow me, I'll just read until I feel better. From the NRSV translation, hear now the word of the Lord. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs. What must I do to be saved? They answered, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Again, verse 31, they answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. You may claim your seats in the presence of the Lord. I want to lift as a subject from which to preach. It's a family affair. It's a family affair. I do want to disappoint you at the very beginning of this message. Sly and the family stone are not here today. And in the event you were preparing to electric slide, Ballroom hustle, Tamiya hustle, 
whatever your dance of preference might not be doing that today. And yet I still submit to us, I still suggest to you that it's a family affair. It's still a pool party. As we walk through this particular text today, one of the things that arrested my attention is the fact that God consistently reserves the right to turn everything around. That's a word for somebody this morning. I mean for the folks who have experienced what it's like to be in some dark, desolate, and destructive places. I'm, I'm talking about far out and deep down. If you've never experienced the kind of situation that I'm attempting to frame and describe, just keep living. I'm talking to the 53 of us who have experienced, here's the church word, the vicissitudes of life, the, the struggles of life, the disappointments of life, the persecutions of life, the, the sadness and misfortune and isolation that life can bring. I'm talking to those of us who know what it is to struggle, and the struggle is not a result of anything that you've done wrong. I'm talking about real struggle and, and hardship. That, that kind of hardship, that, that is the kind of struggle that God is able to turn around. I, I, love, I love the language of our text this morning. Because it uses two words that I'm going to offer up initially and come back and get later. Suddenly and immediately. There are times in life where God makes us wait. And there's no rhyme or reason. You hear that God has a plan for you and it seems that the days keep passing and you don't see the plan. The weeks keep passing and you don't see the plan because what what you and I expected God to do suddenly or immediately, God waits and performs eventually. But every now and then, God reserves the right in his own sovereignty, power, providence, and wisdom to expedite the eventually and move either suddenly or immediately. I'm just trying to help us to understand that God reserves the right to turn things around. Maybe things seem to be backwards in your life, inside out or upside down. I've come on divine prophetic assignment to let you know that God is able to turn things around. Problems on your job, God is able to turn things around around. Difficulty in your finances, God is able to turn things around. Trouble in your home, it's a family affair. God is able. I wish I had a more profound message for you today. God is able. I've learned to lean into and depend upon the ableness of God. God is able. To turn things around. The time of our text, we are introduced to two brothers by the name of Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas do not appear out of nowhere. In fact, Paul specifically has a very unusual story. We are initially introduced to Paul whose name initially was Saul in Acts chapter 9. Saul was a very talented and promising rabbinic student. He was a protege of Gamaliel on his way to being a generational religious leader and talent. Paul, as Saul, knew the law inside and out. 
In fact, Scripture tells us that he was zealous in terms of keeping the law. So much so that this small but growing sect within Judaism known as the Way, who would eventually become the church, was wreaking havoc because they professed to be followers of a crucified, penniless prophet from Palestine who was put to death by Roman execution on a cross but had claimed to be raised from the dead on the third day. And although his physical presence can no longer be found in the earth, his few followers have now banded together believing that they have been enabled by this invisible power called the Holy Spirit. For some time now, these band of believers have gone about talking about how they've been empowered to go locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally in the name of Jesus Christ. So much so that they've been preaching in the name of Jesus. They've been teaching in the name of Jesus. They've been healing in the name of Jesus. And when confronted as to why they keep talking about the name of of Jesus, their testimony is this. We can only testify of that which we have seen and what we have heard. In fact, the old folks would say it like this. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. They knew that there was something about the name of Jesus. And all brothers and sisters, you and I ought not have to peruse the pages of the pericope to attest that there is something about the name of Jesus. You and I can testify from our own life's experience that when I call on the name of Jesus, something happens. Demons tremble. Chains break. Yokes are destroyed. Bow down. Heads are lifted. Knees are met. Souls are saved. Lives are changed. Everything turns around when I call. Is there anybody here who can can testify that there is something about the name of Jesus. And so this is the testimony of the apostles. This is the testimony of the believers and the followers of the way, those who have espoused Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. But understand, brothers and sisters, that this puts the apostles and all of the followers of the way in direct contrast with those who hold to the traditional tenets of Judaism. In the Old Testament, we learn that God chose Israel to be a possession unto himself. He chose them as his chosen people, and he blessed them, and he lifted them, and he walked with them, and he gave them a covenant. He said, I will be your God, and you will be my people. But to identify who you are to me and who I've called you to be in the world, I have some expectations of you. I, I have some precepts and some laws that I expect you to follow. And since that time, brothers and sisters, since Moses became the first person to download data from the cloud on Mount Horeb, the Jews have been following the law of Moses. Some 700, some odd laws that they were responsible to keep in order to maintain holiness or right standing with God. But the problem was that, that there were too many laws and, and, and it was impossible to keep the law. But the law was simply a guardian of until God sent a Messiah to fulfill the law and not replace the law. This, this put them in contrast with everything that they believe. So much so that one of the great controversies of the day was what does it mean to be in right standing or right relationship with God? How is it that you and I can be in right standing with God? Some said, the Jews who, who held on to orthodoxy, to their traditional faith practices, said that in order to be in right standing with God, you have to have faith, but that faith is authenticated by physical circumcision. Yeah, th this is Peter's theological position. But Paul says, no, circumcision of the flesh isn't what's necessary. But once you have faith in God through Jesus Christ, there does need to be a circumcision, but it needs to be a circumcision of the heart. 
And so now there, there, there has been some clashing, some, some confusion. But what happens in Acts 11 is that Peter is affirmed as an apostle to the Jews, but Saul, whose name would change two chapters later to Paul, has his ministry and apostolic work affirmed to the Gentiles. And ultimately what we see is that Saul, whose name changes to Paul, is so inspired by his Damascus experience in Acts chapter 9 that he begins traveling and preaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ. All before Acts chapter 9, Saul was the greatest persecutor of the Christians, of the believers. But after Acts chapter 9, Saul's name changes to Paul in Acts 13, and he becomes the greatest evangelist to the Gentiles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm just trying to help you to understand that God reserves the right to turn everything around. And so Paul goes on a missionary journey. He he goes with Barnabas and he travels throughout Asia. And, and Paul has a desire to continue traveling throughout Asia, but the Holy Spirit interrupts his plans. And might I suggest to us, brothers and sisters, that in all your living and in all of your planning, God reserves the right to step in and change your plans. God, God reserves the right to turn everything around. And, and the Holy Spirit comes to Paul by, by way of a dream and says, no, your help is needed in Macedonia. And there's a sharp disagreement over John Mark. And so Paul says, I'm going to take Silas. Barnabas, you take John Mark, y'all go your way, and we'll go our way. If I had a little more time, I would tell you that problems in the church didn't originate with Fairfield. There always have been fights and arguments and disagreements about how to do ministry. And sometimes you got to go your way and let other folks go their way. But God still reserves the right to turn things around. And so Paul leaves Asia and begins to travel now through Europe. And as he travels through Europe, he makes these different stops. And, and one interesting stop that he makes, he, he meets a woman by the name of Lydia. Lydia is special because she is a wealthy woman. She deals in purple fabric a royal color and an expensive color. She meets Paul. She receives Jesus Christ and now becomes influential in her area. But it doesn't stop with Lydia. Here's where Paul and Silas really run into problems. They are walking about, minding their business, and there's a little girl who has a spirit of divination. I, I, she does not have a name, but if you'll allow me and give me hermeneutical latitude this morning, I want to name her Cleo. If you call her now, she can tell you all about your future. And her employers made a lot of money off of her because she was accurate with her predictions. But she kept on bothering Paul and Silas. She kept on saying, I know who you are. You are an apostle of Jesus Christ. And she would not stop talking about who they were and what they were sent to do. And finally, Paul got so fed up that he said to the spirit in the woman, come out. And the spirit left the girl and when her owners saw that she was no longer a money-making enterprise, they became irate with Paul and Silas. 
They turned the crowds against them. They had them arrested and thrown into jail. I might be all by myself, but it is amazing to me that you can be doing the right thing. You can be minding your own business. You can be doing the right thing and still seemingly end up in the wrong place. Paul and Silas were minding their business. They weren't bothering anybody. In fact, they were being bothered. And Paul did what I would have done. I would have just handled it. I don't bother nobody. I don't want nobody bothering me. Paul says, come out. money-making enterprise is gone. And now Paul and Silas are in jail. They are in Philippi in jail. Just got there and they are in jail. They've been booked. They are in jail. Been fingerprinted. They are in jail. Had to surrender all of their personal effects. They are in Jail had to take off their civilian clothes and put on prisoner clothes. They are in jail. Nobody to call. Being served soggy cookies and sandwiches. They are in jail. There was no motorcade to get them out of Fulton County early. They are in. Y'all ain't gonna help me here. They're in jail. And do you know what some of us would have done? Some of us would have submitted our resignation. I didn't sign up for this. This is not how I planned for my life to go. I'm out of here. I, I, I was better off when I was making tents in Tarsus. But that's not what Paul and Silas were doing. They were going through a dark time in their lives. They found themselves in jail in Philippi. And not only was it a dark time in their lives, but it was a dark time outside. It was, it was midnight according to verse 25. And they were not contemplating how to quit. They were not contemplating how to make an escape. They were in jail. And the Bible says, and at midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. You missed it. They're in jail. Hadn't done anything wrong. They're not trying to plan an escape. Not thinking about quitting. Not thinking about turning away from God. But on contrary, in the middle of jail. In the middle of their cell. For what should have been a disturbing and dark place in their lives. While they are in jail at midnight, they are opening their mouths and they are singing and praying and giving praise unto God. And all oh, brothers and sisters, you'll know where you are in your walk with God when it doesn't matter where you find yourself in life. When you learn how to turn a jail into a sanctuary, when you learn how to turn your dark place into a citadel, when you've made up in your mind that that no matter where I am or what I'm going through, that God is still worthy to receive glory, that God is still worthy to receive honor, you can rejoice because even in your dark places, God will never leave you nor forsake you. They aren't looking to get out. They're actually looking to go in a little further. And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God you know the problem with some of us some of us would be calling our frat brothers and our sorrows some of us would be trying to call our bosses I, I wonder I wondered why I wondered why Paul and Silas didn't use the one phone call that every prisoner is entitled to then I had to look again and I said about well, yeah they did because when you know that when you call upon the name of the Lord, 
the Lord will show up for you in ways that nobody else can. When you learn who to really call when you're in trouble, you can sing like the old church. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. I'm just trying to tell you that God reserves the right, help me here, to turn everything around. They, they were singing, they were singing praises and praying unto God. And the Bible says, and the prisoners heard them. Now y'all be on your best behavior because I'm trying to get through this part. Verse 26 says, Verse 26, it says, uh, it says suddenly, they in jail, not looking for a way of escape, not happy about it, but they're praising God in it. They're singing hymns and, and praying unto God and and everybody heard them. All of the prisoners heard them. And then suddenly. <laughs> Bible says there was an earthquake. It was so violent. Thank you, Derek. It was so violent. That the foundation of the prison was shaken. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake and the foundation of the prison was shaken and everyone's bands were loosed. What I'm trying to help us to understand is that when Paul and Silas called on the name of the Lord, the very things that were holding them had to let them go when God showed up on the scene. And when you know that God is faithful to show up for you, it doesn't matter where you find yourself. I wonder if they remembered what happened to Jesus as he was inside a cell called a grave when the Lord showed up. Death had to let go. When Paul and Silas prayed and God showed up, the chains had to let go. Fairfield, all I'm saying to you is that when you call on the name of the Lord, whatever's holding you down, whatever's holding you back, whatever has you underfoot has to let you go because we have a God that if he doesn't do it eventually, if he doesn't do it immediately, he's able to show up and turn things around. Somebody shout suddenly. I, I didn't know how it was going to happen, but suddenly I didn't know why the doctors couldn't find the spots, but suddenly didn't know how the bills were going to be paid. But suddenly, suddenly God showed up suddenly and he did it suddenly. Got to move. Y'all be seated. And everyone's, everyone's, everyone's chains were were loosed they were they were unfastened the bible says when the jailer when the jailer woke up when the jailer saw that everybody's chains had fallen off when the jailer had saw that the folks who had been shackled have been set free. I wish I had a praying church this morning. When the jailer saw that, that everybody had been set free, the Bible says that he drew his sword and was preparing to kill himself. 
Now, this is, seems to be a very strange situation. Why would the jailer take his sword out in preparation to kill himself? Well, the jailer understood Roman law. That, that as the jailer, he was responsible for all of the prisoners. Which means that if somebody escaped, you had to pay for it with your life. You were held accountable. What I'm trying to help you to understand is that the jailer didn't see a way out. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't just looking at being fired. He wasn't looking at just simple desk duty. His life was over. That was it. That was, that was the Roman way. That was the precedent. That was, that was protocol. He knew the law. He was getting ready to kill himself. And, and, and just, just as he was getting ready to commit suicide, just, just, just as he was getting ready to end it all, just as he was getting ready to make a permanent decision for a temporary situation, the Lord stepped in for him. Okay. Can I tell you why church folk get on my nerves sometimes? You and your cousins get on my nerves sometimes because you think that God is only on your side. You, you, you think that God is only for, for you. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. God loves you and your enemy. God, God loves the Democrats, the Republicans, and the independents. And it's amazing to me. that God shows up suddenly for Paul and Silas, but God shows up immediately for the jailer. Isn't it amazing how God knows just when to step in for you? No, I mean, I'm for real. I'm, can anybody testify that I was getting ready to lose my mind? I was getting ready to quit, but the Lord stepped in just in the nick of time. I was down to my very last dime, but the Lord stepped in. I was getting ready to quit my job, but, but the Lord stepped in. I was getting ready to cuss them out and punch them out, but the Lord stepped on in. And so, we got to go. So, so, Paul and Silas yell out. The jailer has his sword. And they say, they say, no, don't do it. Don't, don't do it because we're all here. We, we don't have chains on, but we're still in your custody. Don't, don't, don't hurt yourself. Don't harm yourself. Bible says, Paul shouted to him. And the jailer called for the lights. He rushed in and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And here's what he said. He said, what must I do? to be saved. Sozo in the, in the Greek. What, how, how, what do I need to do to be saved? Some, some scholars and theologians suggest that, that the jailer was talking about what, what can he do in order for his job to be, to be saved? What, what can he do for his livelihood uh, to be rescued? And, and while it is plausible, while it is it's possible, it doesn't seem likely that the jailer was concerned 
about his job. Because the jailer had just witnessed something more significant than his job. See, one of the things that you and I have to understand when we read Acts and really the balance of the New Testament is that there is always this interplay between which government has the most power. Is it, is it the government of, of Rome which represents the prevailing power of the day? Is, is Rome in charge or is there another entity that is in charge? Is there another government that is in charge? Is there another ruler that sits high above the emperor? Is there, is there another power that can command the sun to shine by day and the moon to give its evening twilight? Is there another power that is able to fling the stars into their silvery sockets until they shine like diamonds on black velvet. Is there another power that has more imperialistic stretch than that of the government of Rome? And I come to let you know that yes, there is another power that's greater than Rome. Yes, there is a king that sits above the emperor. In fact, he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. He's the fairest of 10,000. In fact, he's the stone that the builders reject that has become the head of the corner. His name is Jesus and of his kingdom there shall be no end. The jailer says, what must I do to be saved? I love how that word saved translates. It literally translates to rescued. What in the world are you talking about? The jailer is not imprisoned. The jailer does not wear chains, but yet his question translates to, what do I need to do to be rescued? I, I thought that I've been living life the best way there is, but after I heard the songs you were singing, and after I heard the prayers that you prayed and now that I've seen that the prison has been shaken the thing that seems to be unshakable has been shaken and all of you don't have any chains on I want to know what do I need to do to be rescued and all oh, brothers and sisters don't you know that that's what the world is asking it looks like they're free but they're in need of being rescued it looks like they're happy but they're in need of being rescued what must I do to be Say, gotta go. They answered and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And the Bible says they spoke the word of the Lord, they spoke the word of the Lord to him. He and his household heard it and were baptized. I've just come to tell you that the name of Jesus still saves to the uttermost. I, 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 wish, I wish I really had time to deal with it the way that I want to because if I had two more football minutes, I would talk about how total restoration can happen when men stand up and lead their households into a relationship with the Lord Jesus. I, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what Mr. Jailer said to Mrs. Jailer when he went home. I, I wonder what that conversation was. Ba baby, I know, I know that you're used to shopping at the commissary and the exchange. I know that you've enjoyed some of the privileges and luxuries of Roman living, but I gotta tell you what happened to me tonight. I've had an encounter with the man that I heard about. I didn't see him walk into the jail, but on my shift tonight, I can tell you that there was a man who showed up. I heard that he had the power to set folks free. I heard that he had the power to set the captives completely free. But let me tell you, I heard one thing, but I saw for myself tonight that there's power in the name 
of Jesus. And now my life has completely turned around. And I want you to know what I know tonight. That Jesus Christ in your life makes a complete difference. That Jesus Christ in your life has the power to turn everything around. And since this is good enough for me, now I want my whole house covered. I got to sign off now, but my soul is happy. For the better part of a year now, I've been talking with Eric Jr. and Sharice about how Jesus Christ makes a difference in your life. For the better part of a year now, they've been consistent in Sunday school to the point where they don't want to miss a Sunday because I wanted them to know that Jesus Christ makes a difference in your life. They've been going to Sunday school. They've been singing with next gen. This is not a brag, I'm testifying. And we've been talking about baptism. Well, they decided last week, after a year of conversations, after a year of praying, after a year of testing, that today would be their day to be baptized in the Family Life Center. I'm just trying to help you to understand that when men make up their mind to choose Jesus Christ, it becomes a family affair. That's all I've come to tell you. You ought to be man enough. You ought to be saved enough. You ought to be grateful enough to lead the people in your house into a relationship with Jesus Christ. If God has been good to you, if God has made the way for you, if God has opened doors for you, you ought not be ashamed to tell the folks who have your DNA that serving the Lord will pay off after a while. Look at what happened in jail, but giving God glory in chains but still giving God praise nothing about the situation has changed but I've learned that God does not need an ideal situation in order for him to step in and turn it around in fact I submit to you this morning that it seems to me that God takes special interest in the bad situations God takes special interest in the worst of situations. I don't know who you are this morning, but I'm talking to those of you who came into the son's house with your head bowed down, cumbered with a load of care, don't know how you're gonna make it, don't know how you got in the situation that you're in. I've come to tell you, don't throw yourself a pity party. Throw yourself a pool party right where you are. You ought to open your mouth and give God praise because trouble doesn't last always. You ought to open your mouth, slip your hand in the air and give God glory if you know that God has the power to turn it around right where you are. You ought to lift your hands right where you are. You ought to open your mouth if you know that God is able to show up suddenly, immediately, or eventually. You ought to high five somebody. You ought to go across the aisle and tell your neighbor, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through, but I've come to tell you that wherever you are, God is able. Look at somebody else and tell that neighbor, neighbor, God's getting ready to turn it around in your life in your family, in your household. 
on your job in your community is there anybody here who can help me give God praise has God made a way for you has God opened doors for you won't he show up won't he make a way won't he fight your battles won't he turn it won't he turn it won't he turn it around is he all right is he all right say yes yeah 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 Yes, he will. Yes, he will. High five somebody for the last time and tell your neighbor, neighbor, God's getting ready to turn it around. God's getting ready to fix it for you. If you know he will, help me give God praise. He's worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy. Don't you dare leave here worried about it. Don't you dare leave here crying about it. Don't you dare leave here ready to quit on God. Don't you quit before God turns it around for you. Don't quit before God makes the change fall. God is able. The doors of the church are open. Doors of the church are open. You may be here. On the verge of giving up where you are. Because you thought you needed to be in a sanctuary for God to turn it around. Uh-uh, I'm so glad that God still makes jail calls. I'm so glad God shows up for visitation. I'm so glad that there are no lengths that God is unwilling to go in order to show us that he's willing to turn it around for us. And here's the real shout. God doesn't just turn it around so you can brag for yourself. But God uses us as examples to the world that if God can do it for me, then God is able to do it for you and for you and for you and for you and you and you and you and you. And you. If you're here today, you want to see the power of God activated in your life. You want to be rescued. You want to be saved. You can be saved today. I want to be real with you. Being saved does not mean that you'll never have any troubles. Being saved does not mean that you'll never have any problems. Here's the joy of being saved. The joy of being saved is knowing that even when problems show up, God won't leave me chained to them. Even when problems show up, God won't leave me in the situation that I'm in. If he doesn't do it immediately, if he doesn't do it suddenly, God is faithful to turn it around eventually. I'm not selling you a pipe dream. That's not fake hope. That's not false hope. Not alternative facts. 
God is able to turn things around for you and your family if you step out and trust him. If you're here today, this message was for you, this word was for you, and you need to step out on faith, come on today. Don't worry about who's beside you. Guess what? Let the other prisoners hear you. If you know that God has been good to you, it ought not matter where you are. Let folks hear you. Let folks talk about you. If you're here today, I wouldn't delay. Come on today. Is that Rod Parks? Made it through open heart surgery. Within an eyelash of checking out of here. But God is able. Y'all not happy. God is able to turn it around. If you're here today, you ought to come. Give your life to Christ today. If that's you, main floor, balcony, you're worshiping online. Type salvation. We're ready to minister to you wherever you are. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm in covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But maybe you're here and you don't have a church home. You don't have a place to grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not growing where you're going and you feel the Spirit of the Lord calling you to connect to this household of faith. We would love to be your family. I would love to be your pastor. If that's you, just come on today. Main floor, balcony, worshiping online. Type your decision. We're ready to minister, minister to you today as our music ministry blesses us in song. If you're here, this is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and knock.